We're going to talk a little offensive lineman with it. We always enjoy talking about the Crimson Tide. Matt, it's always like an annual conversation with Allstate and promoting uh, the good good works guys, but uh, it's always good to see because we know now college football is right around the corner. Yeah, this is kind of the landmark event in our summers now, right? We have now announced that college football season is here. And we're your final interview. So leave Are it. we? Yeah, mm-hmm. this is it, right? So with the final interview? I don't know. You never know. No, no. So leave it, it keeps, all right here. Keeps expanding. Le- le- this is like the fourth quarter right here. Okay. You got two minutes to go. How many interviews have you done today? Be honest. Holden, how many have we done today? 30? 25? Oh, yeah. You've been a very busy 25, guy. 25, that's it. That's okay. disappointing. That's an underwhelming number. What's the craziest question that you've got on Radio Row so far? Uh, somebody asked me if I drank milk out of a glass or out of the carton or a milk jug. That was a great question. It was one of my favorite questions. Really? Yeah. What, what was your answer? Uh, I'd rather not disclose. Okay. I think that that's too personal. The, the other question was, uh, do I put butter on my Pop-Tarts, which, of course, I don't. That defeats the whole purpose of the Pop-Tart. The Pop-Tart's butter? intended to be convenient, and if you have to add butter to it, that's just a whole other step that's unnecessary. All right. I want to connect you with what we're talking about here. Let's talk about, because we got Jamie Mosley, which is an Alabama guy. Yep. And these are the fun stories of college football because – I got to be honest with you, as a media guy, we focus too much at times on the negative, and sometimes we need to cover a little bit of positive, and, and let's do that. Talk about the All-State, uh, the, the Good Hands team and, and the Good Works team, what you guys are. I'm saying Good Hands, but it's Good Works. Everybody says Good Hands. Why, why is that? Because I, it's almost like it's a slogan for All-State. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's their, it's their slogan. But this is the Good Works team. We've got, uh, this year there's 12 players out of the SEC that have been nominated for the National Good Works team. We'll only end up electing, or they'll only have 11 guys from the FBS level. So, um, out of all the programs that compete at the FBS level, there'll only be 11. But once again, the SEC's got a really strong representation. uh, 12 of its 14 teams with nominees. Uh, And then we'll elect another 11 from the rest of the division. So, this is it's the best off the field recognition you can garner as a college football player. And, um, the FCA and all state has done a phenomenal job of making sure that these kids get the recognition that they deserve, but also more importantly to, uh, I think illuminate what they're doing and then encourage other kids to try to do that as well. That way you get a multiplier effect. There's a lot of kids doing some amazing things already in their communities and ways of giving back and volunteerism. But they can always do more, and you can always spawn the next generation that will be doing that again. That's the whole point of the team. Well, and, and I know this is not part of what we're talking about here, but it is kind of part of what we're talking about. Yeah. Nick Saban, one of the things that's often overlooked, and if you don't live locally, you, you don't really see it. You might hear about it. You know, Nick Saban has built 17 houses for wow. underprivileged families in, in Tuscaloosa because it's one – for every national title that Alabama has. And, and every time they win one, he built he built another one. This And his players actually helped him this year. And they have in the past, but it was more of an, an involved. And it's just, it's fun to see that because that's life changing. I mean, I mean think about building a house. You, you're changing. I'm just thinking about, so if that's the, the threshold that has to be met before you build a house, only in Alabama would that have like a, relatively significant impact there's a lot of programs about hey man we win the national championship i'll build you a house that doesn't mean much to me because the odds of you winning a national championship ain't that great in alabama if you're saying look i tell you what every time every time we win a national championship i'll build you a house that's not a bad bet to take it's sweet because here in a couple of years maybe next year maybe the year after that i'm gonna get me a new house there's not many programs where you'd be like, okay. I mean, five out of the last. Let's fall out on that limb. Five out of the last nine. So he's built, but he even he caught up because he built all the ones to catch up prior to Nick yeah, Saban's no, arrival. That was fantastic. But, but you a fantastic see the thing. you see the players out there working, and and you just think that's the good side of college football. And it, it's there's it's, a, what's unfortunate is that that really is college football. Where there, there's not the other side. The idea that there's this negative side. That's not even a side. It's not even a corner. I mean, the, the stories that we end up covering in the media, and we all do it, 
that are negative in nature, which they do, they deserve coverage. Uh, they don't deserve near the emphasis that we place on it, I don't think. Um, but it's so vastly outweighed by the good that's coming out of college football that it's hard to even pretend like it's two sides to a coin even. It's, it's just not proportional. There's so much more good that's being done and carried out by these players and their coaches and these programs and athletic departments in general that, uh, you know, it's it's not really even a, a fair comparison. It's the outlier events that happen to be negative that, uh, unfortunately, because of the level of scandal or salaciousness or whatever it is, impropriety, we pay an undue amount of attention, I think, towards that. It deserves some attention, but there's way more good that's going on that needs to have more light shed upon it. Because of your position with the SEC and ESPN, and you have a chance to get a chance to peel back the curtain a little bit and see behind the scenes, what's different about Nick Saban that these other coaches are not doing? Mm-hmm. When you travel around, is, is there – is there something that jumps jumps out? No. No. You know, here's the thing: is that if there was any one way to do it, then I think you could probably snap a chalk line on that. It's been proven. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. What Alabama's done is achieved a certain level of consistency, of excellence that hasn't really been rivaled in recent years. I could make cases for uh, some Nebraska teams. I could make some cases a case for. Uh, FSU in their heyday. I can make a case for Miami. But in today's time, uh, this is it's unprecedented, to say the least. And you know, now you could even argue that they've eclipsed even those quote-unquote dynasties, if you want to call it that. But to think that there's any one thing that he's doing that would universally apply to all these other coaches is hard because all these coaches have unique approaches unto themselves. So if Coach Saban is doing 10 things that are integral to their success, the idea that one of those 10 things or two of those 10 things is devoid in all of the other coaches is kind of hard to imagine. Some of those coaches probably do eight of the 10 things. Another coach probably does seven, but his seven are different from the other guy's eight. So there's not any one thing. I will say that when we did the uh, film room on the SEC Network, that film room show, uh, he did two things that none of the other coaches did that I thought was very interesting. One, he came in and he wanted to see every clip that we planned on talking about, and he wanted to know what we were going to talk about it. And uh, he gave, he didn't talk the entire time, and as I described what it was we were looking for, he just sat there, and it was incredibly awkward. Um And yet, when we got done talking through those plays and you turn on the camera, uh, he, you know, puts on the camera face. Not that that's a distinct person. It's the same person, but he gets at what we're doing now. Uh, And on every single one of those plays, he at some point in time in his commentary touched on exactly what it was that we were talking about, which makes it that much more, that much easier to build the show. And afterwards, this was the other thing that he did. Um was he said, was that good? Did you get what you needed? And, you know, this isn't to say the other coaches that, that we worked with were fantastic, but that was different. Those are two things that were very different and, and frankly, uh, unexpected because he is a very busy guy and is a very, from what I understand anyway, a regimented schedule. But those were two elements that, was, that were uh, unique uh, to Coach Saban in that regard. Let's talk offensive line here for a couple of minutes. Um, Let's play the scenario, left-handed quarterback, right-handed quarterback. How big of a change is that for an offensive lineman? Depends on the system, I think. Uh, The systems that I played in, it was a big deal because, you know, most offenses are right-handed. So the strength of the formations are on the right side, et cetera. So your protection schemes typically would – lend help or send help or slide towards the quote-unquote blind side um, of the quarterback. So, you know, in a lot of instances, depending on the offensive system, mind you, that right tackle position is actually a tougher position to play on passing downs because he's not going to get any help. He's on the island. You send help to the best best pass rusher on the uh, opposing team's defense, which oftentimes is lined up across the left tackle's face. So, you go to a left-handed quarterback, and now you're a left-handed offense. And you're left-handed, the strength would be to the left um, because you obviously want to be able to protect that quarterback's blind side. 
so much has changed offensively now that I'm not sure that it has as significant an impact as it used to have. But right-handed, left-handed was kind of a big deal. You know, we were in Tampa Bay, Coach Gruden's offense. You went from Brian Greasy, who's a right-handed quarterback, or Brad Johnson, who's a right-handed quarterback, to uh, Chris Sims, who's a left-handed quarterback. It flips all your protections. Now all the slides go in the opposite direction, and the protecting backs go in the opposite way. And now the left guard, who always had help, seemingly, is on an island, and the left tackle is on an island. What do you see in Jonah Williams? Just about everything you'd want to see in an offensive lineman. He's that guy's. Uh, he's been impressive since the day that I got to see him. I know, I've never seen him in practice. I don't know what his practice habits are like. I would imagine they're really good. But on game day, um, he's got just about whatever it is, whatever box you're looking to check. I think he's got that. I mean, he's an out. Is he a huge human being? He's not. He's not a huge human being. He's a big dude. But for offensive tackles, is he huge? Nah, no, he's not. But um, he's incredible. I think he's a really efficient player. He's, uh, and that's all you really want. You want to be effective and efficient. The guy's both. All right, we we talk a lot about Tua Tonga Valoa taking over in the second half. I don't know if we spend enough time talking about Alex Leatherwood. Jonah Williams goes down with the injury, and that nasty front that Georgia brought to Atlanta and carried throughout the season. And big Alex Leatherwood at left tackle didn't miss a beat, and and really I think you could probably make the argument he might have even played a little bit better in that second half. I mean, that's not that's not easy to do, come off the bench and go up against that nasty group and, and to be able to sort of anchor that left side. Yeah, well, and with a guy that's not used to playing, right? Sure. Uh, and uh, Tango Valoa. It's unbelievable in a lot of ways. Uh, and at the same time, you know, you've got a, a different skill set at quarterback now. So defensively, George is probably a little bit off balance. You know, I mean, this is a guy that can run and throw. Jalen Hurts can run and throw. He can't run and throw the way Tango Valoa can. Uh, and as he demonstrated in that game. Now, I say can't, didn't in that game anyway. Um, and so because of that, you know, I think that that impacts – how a defense plays, how a defense is called. And look, let's see this for what it is. If Georgia sacks Tagovailoa on that third possession, I don't know this for a fact, but I think there's a real good chance that the Tagovailoa experiment is ended after three inauspicious series, one that narrowly escaped calamity off of a block punt. And you say, you know what, we'll put Jalen back in here and hope you catch a break. Because offense wasn't going anywhere in the first half, but at least you know Jalen is a known commodity, and this isn't working any better with, with Tua. But they didn't sack him. And part of the reason why they didn't sack him is because that kid's a great athlete. And then he scrambles around, buys time, and then hits a bomb down. I mean, it's just it's a different skill set. And I think that that helps as well because the defense is now dealing with a different animal. The best way to change an offense in the fewest number of moves is to make a change at quarterback, which is exactly what we ended up seeing in that title game. We've seen Alabama win five out of the last nine. A.J. McCarron was a awesome quarterback. I mean, it's an All-American quarterback. And really, if you go back to Alabama, first All-American quarterback we've had since the 40s with Harry Gilmer. So wow. A.J. McCarron did something that it's been a long time. And so you never take anything away. He was winning his quarterback, set all these records. But really, they've done it with playing within what Nick Saban wants them to do. We label the game manager tab. I don't know if that's fair. Howard Snellenberger said it's the best compliment you can ever give a quarterback if he can play within the system that he's defined. But now you've got a guy that, into a tongue of a low, if he wins the job, it might change that position. Do you see it that way? Does he have that characteristics that you think may change that position under Nick Saban? So we think he's so good that he'll just – if so if, if we're contending that up until now – You've won five national titles, and the quarterbacks have played within a scope of, of, of play that Coach Saban has defined. And Tago Vailoa is so good that we're now going to expand that scope of play. I think offensively, I think I think you'll see a different change. Why? Why change now? To say that you can? I mean, because... That seems like a fool's errand Well, I did, but maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe, so, I'm so, not saying that he doesn't have the capacity to do that. If that's where you're saying from a skill set standpoint, well, you got is he the best passer who's mobile? Blake Sims was mobile. Sure. That Blake, They won a lot of games with Blake Sims. You want to make a case for what a great coach Lane Kiffin is, as oh, I understand oh, it? Oh, it's, 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 it's Blake awesome. Sims. So a combination of skill set, 
I don't know that we've seen that at quarterback for Alabama under Nick Saban. And so if, if that's – then I could see that absolutely impacting how that offense is uh, deployed on the field of play. Is it distinct from all the other years? It might be. Because I, I do think that his is more of a singular talent that we haven't seen before. And I think that's the part that is is a little different because it, it's it may be a different look. I mean, it, it's maybe, you know, you, and you may have to keep up with. You know, you lose a lot of defenders, but I know every year we say the next five star comes off the locker room, and you know, you lose what about a guy. Fourth OC in three years. I mean, does that mean anything to anybody? It could. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's. I mean, a, that's that's another thing I think is lost in a lot of this. Is it that is. How do you continue to play at such a high level when you're just constantly churning at coordinator? Just. It's another new coordinator, another new OC. Now it's another new DC. Just plug in another dude. How do you do that? Uh, I'll never forget. Look, I got an idea, by the way. All right. Well, you, you hired the best coach in college football history. You all right. Best, I, I, you have, you I, I want to hear your best, answer. You recruit the best players. Well, sure. Yeah. You recruit the best players. Yeah. Well, we have a coach that Not comes. that coaching doesn't matter. It does. Coaching matters a lot. Sure. But if you got the best players, that's a nice head start. Five stars every position. And you've got a head coach that can handle that type of turbulence because it's going to happen. If you're an elite coaching staff and you're a program that's achieving at a really high level, your coaches are going to get poached. I mean, it's a compliment to your staff. If your coaches aren't getting poached, you got to wonder, I wonder how good these guys are. But isn't that amazing foresight for Nick Saban to look right now? I mean, I mean, I, I think yeah. he's thinking ahead right now. He brought Dan Enos in. It, it, it's you got Bud Jones sitting over here, pretty sharp, offensive minded guy. Uh, maybe things didn't work out from a CEO standpoint. Either way, it, it's like he's always a couple of steps ahead. OK, you take this guy. OK, perfect. I got Michael Oxley here. OK, perfect. OK, I got this. It, it's amazing that he's he knows it's coming. That he's also at a place. I think there's two things. And this has been mentioned a lot of times that people. Oh, a lot of people can win in Alabama. A lot of people haven't won in Alabama. I say a lot. There have been coaches that have gone to Alabama, and they haven't achieved this. No, sure, sure. So you've got resources at Alabama that are unique to Alabama in a lot of ways. There's other schools, obviously, that are that are meeting the ante. But to be able to marshal those resources, that's an entirely different animal. And the fact that Coach Saban has been able to do that, because you've got Steve Sarkeesian, who's a quality control guy, right? He's an analyst. He's a in, form, intern. <laughs> form, for, okay, a former head coach. A, a noted play caller and coordinator, and he's an analyst. And Mike Loxley, former head coach, former right. play, uh, play right. caller, right. analyst. I mean, you've got a bench. Your coaching staff ha- is – you're too deep on your coaching staff? Who, who talks about depth chart at coaching staff? There's one program, Alabama. 